Hey folks, Mr. Eck here. I just wanted to let you know that the video you're about to watch on section 1.2 is a little bit different, and that's because it's a recording of a live class. I've stripped out most of the breaks and comments that we would have had during the live class and just preserved the math content. So without further ado, here's the video on section 1.2. We are actually today going to cover two sections. We're going to cover section 1.1 and section 1.2. And the reason we're doing that is there's not really much you need to know about section 1.1. Uh, section 1.1 is basically like how graphs work. And if you're really curious, I'll, you can go into our drive folder and read about how graphs work. But I think you know that by now. But there is one thing reading that section over, because I did read it for you that I saw you might not know. And it's not a particularly like terribly hard idea, but it's just a notation thing that comes up. Uh, and that's calculator viewing rectangles. So if you open up your graphing calculator and you might have this nearby you, you might not, um, but if you have one, if you have your calculator like within arm's reach, go grab it um, because we're gonna show you some stuff. Um, I'll even turn on the big screen here. This is cool. I like, I really like this toy. Um, if you go, if you want to make a graph, you generally go to your Y equals setting and you can type in any equation you want, you know, 25, uh, we'll do two plus three X, right? Just a line. And if you hit graph, you'll get a nice graph. There it is. It's a graph. Um, but if you want to maybe see a different part of your graph, there's two ways you can approach it. The, the I would say, less useful way is to go to the zoom menu and you can zoom in or out. Maybe I wanna see more of the graph so I can zoom out. You have to pick a center of the zoom. Uh, so you pick where you wanna center the zoom, that's where the little X is, and it will zoom out based on that center point. That's fine, but say that you wanted some real interesting information or you had a, a specific set of data, you would go to the window menu. That's the second gray key. And you can see that there's in the window menu, six options. X min, X max, X scale, and Y min, Y max, Y scale. And so say I want a window, uh, well, we'll come back to these actually. Um, but those are the six options that when your book refers to a viewing rectangle with these, this weird notation of three numbers by three other numbers, that's what they're referring to is those six options on your calculator. So the first option is the X minimum or X min. The second number is the X maximum. The third number is the X scale, which is just where the tick marks are. The fourth number, so that goes by, and then it's the Y. So this is the Y minimum. I just do Y min. 100, in this case, would be the Y maximum. And this would be the Y scale. So if a problem says to you, okay, sketch a graph with this viewing rectangle, and the book might do that because they want uh, everyone to produce the same graph. You know, you guys know how sometimes you might be graphing the same function as your group group partners, but you all end up with different results because you had a different scale. So choosing a rectangle can help with that. So if I was sketching this like by hand, what I would first do is probably draw an axis. And then I would start to label on the axis. My X minimum, which is, it says is negative four. And I'm supposed to count by twos. That's the scale. So I would go negative four, negative two, zero, two, four, six. My Y minimum was zero. And I'm supposed to go to 100 counting by 25. So I could go one, two, three, four, mark that as 100. Mm. And that would be like a good viewing rectangle. And so now say that my graph was on that rectangle, maybe I was graphing a line, you know, there's a line then you and me and your friends and their friends would all have the same graph and the same rectangle. And you can even like draw, can even draw the, the rectangle around it now. So you can see this is exactly what your calculator would show. Um, and if I were to go into the calculator and set that same rectangle, uh, ooh, I wanna clear it. Negative four, enter, six, Two, 
it's just telling you exactly what settings to use in the calculator. Notice how we get like that same nice graph. I had a different line, but we get the same nice, nicely scaled graph as I drew by hand. So that's the purpose of the viewing rectangles is so that we can all agree. And I only bring it up. It's not like I'm gonna, I'm not gonna test you on viewing rectangles, but like it will happen in the middle of chapter four that a homework list, you know, problem 79 talks about a viewing rectangle and people always go, Mr. Eck, what is this nonsense? What are these numbers? Um, and it's just, just describing your, your scales. Let's now continue on to talk about section one, two. That's it, like section one, one, done, all over. Uh, so section one, two. Section one, two is gonna be about the basics of functions uh, and I'll say, and relations. All right, so relations. Let's do some relationship counseling here. Um, a relation in math is a correspondence between two sets. That's it. That's all it is. Um, so the first set is called the domain. And those are the set of inputs. And then the domain or inputs are mapped to the range also known as the outputs. So we map from the domain to the range, inputs map to outputs. One such way that this will be described, so there's a lot of different ways we describe them. Obviously you can describe these with an equation if it's appropriate. Um, but if we're being kind of generalized in math, often you'll see uh, us talk about mapping diagrams. So here's such a diagram. Uh, so here I might have my domain in the left box, in the right box, I might have my range. And then I might just draw arrows to uh, indicate what element of the domain maps to which element of the range. So maybe A maps to one and two. So maybe A is mapped to small numbers. Maybe I choose that B will map to even numbers. So maybe B might map to two and four. And maybe C maps to the third object in the list, which would be three, right? So I could draw these arrows. Sometimes the arrows are curved, sometimes they're straight. It doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, and that's an example of a mapping diagram, um, mapping from the domain to the range. Uh, and this is a relation. Um, those of you that are eagle-eyed or have you know read this ahead or done these before, we'll notice that this relation is most definitely not a function. And there, there's a problem with the way I split my arrows up that makes this a, a not nice relation. And that's okay. Relations don't have to be nice. Um, another way that we can view these mapping diagrams is as a table. And you've seen these before because we just call it, right? This is like all we make in math two and three and one is an in, out table. And so in this case, my input might be input of A might map to one and two. My input of B might map to what I say, two and four. And my input of C might map to three, right? So I could describe it as a table. That would be one way. Um, I could also, if I was making a table for this kind of strange relation, instead of doing two lines for B, I could be like B maps to two or four, be another way to write it. Um, we won't often make tables of relations like this, so it's not a big deal how you format them. Um, and then the last way that we might denote this function, uh, this relation is using function notation. Um, to use function notation, I need to give the relation a name. So uh, often relations and functions use like capital letters for their names. So I'm going to call this relation, relation R, will be the name of my relation. And then I can write the following, R of A equals. So the way a function notation works, and you've probably seen this before, but we're just going over it anyway, so we all agree, is this is the name of the relation, 
do I'll do relation abbreviated. This is the input. So it's not like R times A or R A like a like a letter. Um, name of relation input, and then here is where I'll put the output. Uh, so I would write here that R of A is equal to one or two, and um, it is true that again I'm. R is not actually a function, it's, it's a relation, but I can still use function notation and it actually kind of unveils why, func why it's bad. All right, so what in the world is a function? Or more specifically, why is R of A not a function? Why is it bad? Well, it's bad because of exactly what I wrote here. I wrote that the answer is one or two. Two answers? No good. Right. How many math tests have you taken? Like, like multiple choice tests have you taken where there's two correct answers on a question? Probably very few. And I like to think about my calculator. How many times have you ever done an operation on your calculator and had it give you two separate answers? Like, if I take seven and square it, oh, not that's not squaring it. If I take seven and square it, I'm only ever gonna get one thing, right? I could try it a million times and I'm just gonna get 49 every time. That's because it's a predictable relationship. Even square root, because it has the principal square root rule, I'm only gonna get five because it's programmed to give me the positive answer for this. Never, ever, ever on your calculator will it say five or negative five or five or six. I don't know. That'd be a pretty useless calculator if it if it did that, right? Like an ambiguous calculator. Um, and that is why uh, the function or the relationship R is not considered a function. And it's it's just a relationship. You can have relationships that map things all over the place. Relationships can be really, really vague. I mean, you could have a relationship that maps shapes to colors. I don't care what you put in a relationship, right? Like, you, it's just between any two sets. As long as you have a well-defined map, totally fine. Um, anything can be in a relationship. Now, most of the time, we're dealing with functions and relationships about numbers. It doesn't have to be. All right, so what is a function other than that word that I wrote terribly down there? What is a function? Well, here is the definition of function. Um, I'm going to give two definitions. I'll give kind of an informal one first, and then I'll give the, the official one. Uh, the informal is it's a predictable relationship. So like the opposite of all the soap operas that uh, we're all watching in quarantine now where relationships are unpredictable. Um, but let's be a little more official. What is a mathematical function? A function is a relationship, a relation between two sets where each input value corresponds to only one output. And that only one is really important. Because what that means is that if I specify an input, I know what the output is. And that's what I, why I said predictable, right? Like if I tell you the input, you can tell me the output and we can always, always agree. There'd be no ambiguity about it. Uh, so here's two mapping diagrams. Um, I'm gonna call them P and Q just because I like the alphabet. Uh, and let's look at which one might be a function and which one might not be. P is not a function.
And the reason that P is not a function is because I could write P of A, if I tried to write a function notation and I said, all right, friends, what's P of A? Well, I would write one or two. And it's this like not being sure what the output is, that that would be bad. Q, I, is a, I tried to trick you. Um, notice how I had two arrows that went to two. It's kind of like the reverse of that statement. Uh, so I do have a single output can come, uh, can result, result from uh, more than one input. So that is actually okay. Uh, and the reason it's okay is that I, even though the arrows are going, both going to two, I can still write that, oh, not P, that Q of A is two and Q of C is two. That's not a problem. That's still, it's unambiguous. I just happen to get two twice. And I could write that Q of B is four. Oh, and another thing people sometimes pick up on is that uh, one and three were not like touched. And they think, oh, it didn't get to every element of the range. That's also okay. There will be plenty of times where a function or a graph doesn't uh, hit every element of the range or every element of the domain. Here, I'll give you an example actually of both of them with a function, uh, both of those operations with a function that you are very hopefully familiar with. Oh, it's red now, okay. Y equals X squared. Notice that if I pick a random element of the range, like, you know, three, three did come from two X's. But that's allowed. And it's also true that I only actually am, you know, reaching the top half, the positive Y value of the Y axis. Um, and I don't touch any negative numbers, but that's okay. It's still a function uh, in that sense. Okay, what's next here? Ooh, okay. I wanna go into a little bit of, it's not really function notation. Um, it's more like function wording, a little bit of, of a digression on, on wording just because you are gonna be asked these problems with this wording and I wanna make sure that you understand how important the, the words are. So if I specify a, a graph, uh, oh, y equals x squared, and I might ask you two things. I might ask, is y a function of x? And then I might ask you, is x a function of y? And those are actually really, really different questions. Um, so when you see a question like this, is y a function of x? First, I'm gonna star this first one because this is how it's usually asked and so that's the one that you should like if you're going to know how to do either of these that's the one you have to know how to do um it says is y a function of x this is going to be the output and the a function of x that's saying that x is the input uh, so how do you decide if y is a function of x well you solve for y and then uh, I'm just going to say inspect the equation. So y equals x squared is already solved for y. I don't really have to do a lot. Yeah, it. Uh, um, yeah. So we solve it for y. We inspect the equation. Y equals x squared. Looking at it, uh, I can notice that any input will produce a single output just based on what i know about x squared um that's not it what i want what did i want oh like if you go to your calculator and you square a bunch of numbers you're never going to get different things like there's nothing i can type in even a negative right negative two squared oh that's wrong actually you need to complete your parentheses when you're doing this Notice how important those parentheses were. Even at negative, when you square it, you're always going to get the same thing. There's nothing that's going to give you two answers. Uh, so this is yes. 
y is a function of x. By the way, we often abbreviate function as fn in like in notes, not in not in like formal writing, uh, but just in notes uh, because function is a longish word and nobody likes words. But what if I asked you, is x a function of y? which is kind of like a preview of section 1.8, which is all about inverse functions or reversing relationships. In this case, I'd be asking, what if x was the output and y was the input? So I would solve for x. So I have y equals x squared, and that would translate into x is the square root of y, but when I take that square root of both sides, right, like this, you better add a plus or minus. And so now I might pick an example and say, if y is 25, x is a positive or negative square root of 25, so x is plus 5 or minus 5. And that tells me that x is not a function of y. Um, this is kind of like really picky. You know, whenever you get into like the language of a question, um, it's really picky, but it, it is important. And, you know, especially we're in math four, right? You guys are going to be in calculus next year and it words matter. And in math, especially every little word matters, including the order. I wanted to highlight this just because like, look at this problem we're about to do. Solve each equation for Y and then determine whether the equation defines Y as a function of X, right? There's that language again. So oftentimes, and maybe if you've done this in like math three or whatever, you could just get shortcutted into saying is F a function. And honestly, that's like bad problem writing. If a, if a teacher, and I will do it, I'm guilty of it, um, but that's bad problem writing because it should always specify which variable is a function of the other variable. Um, and sometimes things might be functions one way, but not the other way. Uh, so we're going to solve each equation for y and then, de then determine if it defines y as a function of x. And we're going to do this algebraically, that is using the algebra of the situation. And then I'll show you the trick for graphs. Some of you, again, probably already know the trick for graphs. Um, we'll talk about how to determine this from a graph. Uh, so solve this for y first. All right, that's easy. Uh, 2x plus y is 6. So y would equal 6 minus 2x. OK. And again, I can observe that every x can be multiplied by 2 and subtracted from 6 without any ambiguity. So this appears at least to be a function. Yes, y is a function of x, um, because it's just a regular equation. Uh, in fact, this is, if you'll notice, a linear equation. And so you think about the graph. The graph would look something like this. I think, uh, right, intercept of 6, slope of minus 2. And you could observe that kind of from the graph, every, every x value matches with a y value, but there's no, no back and forth. Let's look at something different. Let's look at the interesting one. x squared plus y squared equals 1. So now I have to really work to isolate y. So I would have y equals 1 minus x squared. And then y would have to equal the plus or minus square root of 1 minus x squared. And now I can kind of see my problem, can't I? So if x is equal to, uh, well, let's see. I don't want to take the square root of a negative. So let's say x is equal to 1 half. 
then y would equal the plus or minus square root of 1 minus 1 fourth, which would be the plus or minus square root of 3 fourths or plus minus, I guess, root 3 over 2. But notice that y is equal to plus root 3 over 2 or minus root 3 over 2. And so from the equation, I can tell that y is not a function of x. Since I had the or value, or I got that plus or minus. And so it's when you have like a square root is one of the really common ways that an equation will tell you that it's not a function. That was kind of irritating algebra, like, right? Like that in algebra. What if we looked at the graphs instead? So what is the graph of x squared plus y squared equals one anyway? I see a circle, circle. I see some clarification that it's a circle at the origin uh, with radius one. Do you guys agree with radius one? I don't know, this is gonna be a terribly drawn circle. I'll do my best. I kind of missed one. It's okay, I can move the I can move the radius. Yeah, and it's that format. Remember uh, that x squared plus y squared will always equal r squared. And if you have that x squared and y squared, then you can notice the r. So graphically, you can see what happened here. I plugged in x equals 1 half, which is right about here. And notice how that x equals 1 half actually matched with two y values. You know, like I'll just call them y1 and y2. And that caused it to, to not be a function. This is now something that's not predictable. Um, which brings me, notice how I drew a vertical line through x equals 1 half. And I was able to observe from that vertical line that x was not a function. That, so that brings me to the vertical line test. There are two ways to state this test, and I'm going to try. They're equivalent. One is kind of positive, and the other is negative. Uh, so I'll say in a graph, y is is a function of x if every vertical line. How do you spell C A L? line through the function hits it. Oh, I should say through the graph because we don't know it's a function. Hits it only once. Uh, the other way to phrase this, version B, goes like this. A graph is not a function, uh, y a function of x is what I should say, if there is any vertical line that hits the graph more than one time. So uh, the drawing for part A is the first example that we did with the linear function. Here is the linear function, you know, intercept of six, slope of two, 
every vertical line I can draw, you know, I could draw infinitely many of these vertical orange lines, but they would still only touch the function. Each line would only touch the function in one spot. That causes, that says, yes, this line is a function. On the other hand, my circle, which is actually easier to draw if you cheat and draw before the axes. Aha. Uh -huh. I can, I only need to produce or draw one line and observe that this vertical line touches the function twice. It is actually true that on the circle, if I choose a vertical line through the edge, it touches it once. But that's why it has to, it's phrased this way where there is any vertical line. Like it's not just like, it's not every vertical line. You just have to break the rule of time, no longer be a function. Um, so this is a good way of checking that uh, your, if you know what the graph is, it's a great way of checking if that graph represents a function or not. Um, most of the time that we work with that are non-functions are going to be circles. If I'm being honest, uh, if we're lucky, maybe they will be ellipses. Like that's probably as fancy as we um, Oh, you want to learn something cool? Let's learn about our calculators a little bit since we've got them out in theory. Um, I want to show you how to graph a circle on your calculator. I'm going to show you how to graph the circle that we just graphed. And this is actually like, it doesn't show up a lot in math four, but I've heard like our calc teachers say, oh man, I wish my kids knew how to graph circles on their calculator. So like, this is something that, um, I have heard from Ms. Bowman and Ms. Uh, Tobin that they really would like you to be able to do. Uh, so here's the problem is if I want to graph a circle and I go into y equals, I can't type in x squared plus y squared equals y because it's already y equals, right? It's the wrong format. Solve the equation for y, just like I did here. But if I actually try that, if I put this in the calculator, uh, so it's the square root of one minus x squared. Oh, where'd she go? There we go. If I type that in, I hit enter, uh, it will happily graph it, right? We can go to the graph. Yeah, that's a little ugly. Okay, and there's a couple things you can do to fix it. First, you can go to your zoom menu and you can zoom square. That will kind of change your settings to be nice, uh, nicely square, um, just because the rectangle doesn't start out as a square. Uh, the zoom square actually makes the graph look better. And you can also zoom in, zoom in, hit enter, and then hit enter again. Okay, there's our nice circle. But wait, it's only half of the circle. Why is that? Well, because your calculator has interpreted this square root as the positive square root. So if you actually want to graph this circle, sadly, you have to do it in two lines. You have to do the positive root and then completely separately the negative root, Ooh, not x2. What do I do? x squared. And now circle. Oh, my video is lagging, but hopefully that that's where we're supposed to be. Um, so you had to do it in two lines because your calculator only really knows how to graph functions. And we are asking it when we say graph a circle to graph something that's not a function. And that's why we have to do this weird thing. Um, Oh, another goofy thing on the calculator is you'll notice how, use my mouse here, you'll notice how the um, edges are not really solid lines. That's just the resolution of the calculator. Like it's already kind of going to the pixel precision here. Um, and it's not, it's trying to not go past one, but it's like out of pixels. So uh, you, you of course should know that this is a circle um, and don't just trust what you see on the screen. So here, I will, I will tell you, here's something I see students do on tests. This is like on a test, I will say graph x squared plus y squared equals one, and then put it in their calculator and they give me this garbage. Uh, it usually looks like this because they haven't set the viewing window and they don't know that it's a circle. So they give me this weird like eye of Sauron looking thing. And uh, I just immediately mark that wrong. I say, I know you can press the buttons right now, but you haven't shown me you actually know what you're doing. 
Uh, so that's something to watch out for, right? If it's a circle, sometimes your brain is smarter than your calculator. I said sometimes, like almost all the time, what you know in your brain is smarter than what you know from your calculator. Okay, that was a little diversion about how to use your calculator and how to draw circles. Um, there are other ways like parametric equations, circles more neatly, but we will have to learn about those in semester two. All right, so we've talked about the vertical line test. Check. Uh, we're gonna stay in section 1.2 and talk about domain and range a little bit. So this is another example problem. Um, so remember that domain was the set of inputs, usually x on a graph, and range is a set of outputs, the, usually the y on a graph. I'll tell you for not 10 years of my life, I got those terms confused every single time, and I still do sometimes. Um, so if it's unfamiliar or you find yourself mixing up which term is which, uh, that's okay. Try to fix it, of course, but it, you know, it, there's a lot of words in this section, a lot of terminology. Uh, so it's just something to work on. Uh, so if I'm going to look at these graphs and use each graph to, do, to identify its domain and its range, uh, what am I going to do? Well, if I have the graph, I can probably just look at it, right? So the domain are the x values that make a graph. So I like to imagine that I'm just like taking a little walk on the x-axis, right? I'm going to walk over here, and everywhere that I see a graph, I'm going to shade. So I, I, starting at negative 2, I see this closed circle that says, oh, there's a graph starting here. And I'll shade along the axis until I reach the point where there's no graph anymore. It looks like at, at 1 here. And then I look at that shaded area uh, where there was a graph, and I say, OK, the domain is negative 2 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 1. And that's my domain. Often domains are written in interval notation instead of inequalities. And uh, I'm not sure why. I think they're equally valid. But you will probably be writing them in interval notation. So what is interval notation? Well, it takes the same information and replaces the x with a comma. So I'm going to write negative 2, comma, 1. And I'm going to do a bracket, square bracket, to match with the less than or equal to symbol. Um, by the way, I'm using the less than or equal to symbol because there is a closed circle. So uh, that means that the point on the end is included in that value. Uh, all right, and let's look at the range. Ranges are the y values. So I imagine, again, that I'm another person walking on the y-axis, walking up and shading wherever I go and where I see a graph. So I see a graph here. Doesn't matter that I cross over it. It looks like I stopped seeing a graph there around 3. So the inequality would be 0 is less than or equal to y, less than or equal to 3. The interval would be 0 bracket, 0, comma, 3, close bracket. That's it for domain and range from a graph. Um, I'll do the other two examples because they each have a little bit of a tweak on there. So second example, the main difference here is that I notice an open circle at the end of the graph. So that means that that point, negative 2, 2, is not included. But every point up to that is included. So it's just that a single dot that's not included. Uh, so if I'm doing the domain, we usually just abbreviate that as D. Uh, the domain on the axis, I start at negative 2, but with an open circle. And I travel all the way over to 1, where it is closed circle. So the domain would be negative 2 less than x less than or equal to 1. And I would write that as an interval by writing 
parentheses negative two comma one bracket. So the parentheses corresponds with the open circle. You guys have seen this before, right? Domain interval notation, parentheses, open circle, closed circle. Like most likely at some point, I think you have. Then if I look at the range, same deal. I'm starting on the Y axis with a closed circle traveling up until I get to two. And I have to remember that there's an open circle at the end of the range. So for the range, make that a better R, it would be negative one less than or equal to Y less than two, strictly less than two. So it would be bracket minus one comma two parentheses. Um, and again, I'm sure some of you are looking at the screen right now and going like, Mr. X, this is baby stuff. I know this for years. Um, yeah, maybe you do. I will tell you that that domain and range from a graph parentheses errors are the most common thing I see as like little things that I'm, I end up taking off points for. So it is just something to always, ooh, always be careful of, no matter how long you think you've been working with these graphs, it is easy to miss the little dots or, or think about the wrong type of bracket. But in math, it's important to convey your meaning, not, you know, like you have to, you have to know it and you also have to, to tell someone else what you know. And that's what the notation is for, is telling everyone else what you know. Let's look at the last graph, because that's, to me, almost the most interesting. So I noticed that this is an example of a step graph or a step function. You've maybe seen these before. I think they, they do show up in math three, uh, but not like a lot. Um, a step function might be useful uh, used if you're talking about like getting paid every week, right? Like I get paid every week, actually every two weeks, but, um, and I don't make money in between. So like drawing a, a straight line doesn't actually make sense to describe like my bank account. Um, but if I'm, I, it would make more sense to draw like a flat line. And then every time I get paid, I, the line goes up. And that's an example of a step function. This is a negative step function, which if it was my bank account, I would be sad to have negative money. Um, so I don't know what this represents. Uh, but if I'm doing the domain, I still, I don't have to worry about the fact that this is in multiple pieces. I just start where the domain starts with a closed circle and I shade in. Now, when I get to this minus two, I am gonna look at it and say, hey, is there a function there? And I notice, well, there's not a function on that lowest piece but there is a dot on the, the middle piece. So that negative two is still included in the domain. So I don't need to do like any fancy breaks or any, any strange notation. I can just, and it's the same deal here, right? There's still just a single dot. I can shade all the way up to zero where there would be an open circle. So the domain would be negative three up to zero parentheses. The range, is far more interesting because if you look at the range and I were to try to highlight it, well, negative three would be included. But if I started shading, like in the other problems, I'm actually doing a bad thing. I'm implying that there's graph over here and there isn't. The graph only really exists on the points or on the values, negative three, negative two, negative one. It's only on those Y values. So for the range, an interval is not appropriate at all. Uh, I could write it in two ways. I could write the range is just y equals negative three, negative two, negative one, or I could write it as a set, right? Set bracket, negative three, negative two, negative one. So this is a set of single values. Which actually, you know, we talked about domain and range functions go from one set to another. It's actually true that an interval is also a set. They're just infinite sets, infinite sets of real numbers, or maybe like replace infinite with the word continuous. They're continuous lines of real numbers, but they're still sets.
So that's kind of fun. Um, I want to show you another notation thing. Uh, so that's one weird notation is if you, if you have a single value range, you might do like a set bracket type of thing instead of an interval. Um, say that you have, I didn't prepare a graph for this, so we'll have to draw one. But say that you arrived, you're walking down the street and you run into like a weird Loch Ness monster looking graph. Like, all right, it looks like this. It goes from, I don't know, negative five to negative one, then disappears for a while and then starts up back at two and like does this. And I wanted to describe the domain of this. Well, the domain, uh, what do I want? I want an open, I want an open circle there. Hold on. Just to make it more interesting. That's an open circle. Uh, if I want to describe the domain, I would highlight here all the way over, but I'd also highlight from two on over. And so the domain would be something like negative five to negative one parentheses because of the open circle. And then I would write, that's smaller, union, because they're sets, right? Domains are sets, so you can take the union of them. Union, uh, bracket, two to infinity. And so that's another way you often see domains in interval notation is with this like uh, multiple intervals combined with the union symbol. It's again that that p dot one, like we said, oh p dot one is secretly the most important session. That's why it's on day one. Yeah, we use this union stuff all the time. All right. Uh, so we've hit some domain stuff. Now we're gonna do. Um, this is probably not actually on the homework, and we've done it a little bit before. But I wanted to show you just some more examples of finding the domain from an actual equation, because that's kind of the more useful thing like these problems here that we just did are really artificial like it's so rare you're walking down the street and someone hands you a graph and says here find the domain of this graph that's ridiculous but you will often in math come across equations and have to decide what their domain is and that to me is the most useful thing so uh there's a couple main situations where you might need to find the domain. And one of them, of course, is if you have a square root. Uh, because the square root of a negative would give you a non-real answer. So what you're going to do with a square root is set the argument, which is our term for like the input of a function or the thing underneath the root, uh, greater than or equal to zero to find the range, to find, uh, sorry, to find the domain. Um, so in this case, I would say X minus three greater than or equal to zero X greater than or equal to three. That's an inequality. I would translate that for the, uh, rain key. See, I told you I screw those up. Don't I, uh, the domain, uh, would be the interval three comma infinity, something like that. So that's how I'd write that domain, um, for this graph. And in fact, if uh, you know how to graph it, or you know, we will actually be graphing these in se section one, the square root graph, here's what the graph looks like. You go one, two, three, and it starts to kind of curve up this way. And there really is just nothing over there. It's, it's like a single-sided graph that just has a specific starting point. Um, so that's an example of a graph with a, a restricted domain and how I find it useful to know the domain before constructing the graph, because that knowledge actually helps me uh, create the graph correctly. Here's another one, and I'm not going to graph this one. Uh, it's an example of a rational function. Ooh. If I have a rational function, one issue with the domain would be dividing by zero. So I would need to set my denominator uh, not equal to zero to figure out what the domain can be. So I would do something like this. So that should not be minus four, no, minus eight, and then X should not be minus four. That's like our excluded values from before. Um, but if I wanted to express this as a domain, and I wanted to do it in interval notation, I have to be a little sneaky. 
because this has told me what X can't be, but domains are, are telling me what X can be. So uh, in a domain interval, I would have to write it like this, uh, negative infinity comma negative four parentheses union parentheses negative four comma infinity. And this idea is that the parentheses excludes the value on either end. So this little piece right here excludes negative four from the domain. And that's kind of how we have to do it. Um, if you're like me, you actually kind of hate that notation that it's, you find it really annoying. Now you're, you, maybe you love it. And like, I don't, a lot of people do. Um, so you could also write the domain here in set builder notation, but you have to be fancy here too. So, and again, you only, you don't need set builder notation for me, but if you would like to know what it is, I would write the following set of X such that X is a real number. So I'm telling me what X is. And now that I've told you what X is, here's what X is not. And that would be like the fancy set builder way of writing X not equal negative, oh, negative four. Um, and that's always gonna be optional, um, but if you didn't feel like doing interval notation, you could do it in set builder as well. And I wanna show you one more thing, which is just sometimes uh, our square roots and our, our fractional functions combine into something that looks like this. So here the domain would be well, this part would tell me that X needs to be greater than or equal to four uh, because anything less than that would give me a negative. But this part tells me that X can't be five. So if I think about what the domain is, it would have to be something like the interval from four up to five parentheses, union parentheses, five up to infinity. And so like when you start to have combinations of roots and fractions and other things together, you can get some pretty wacky domains. You guys wanna see the graph of this? I did prepare that graph and it looks like this. I don't know if you can see that. Here's the, the actual function is here in red. Whoa, 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 whoa. And it is actually a function. You can see it starts at four, but then at five, it has a break where it jumps to the other side of the axis and comes back. But this is actually a single one function with a weird break in the middle um, because of it came from a complicated equation. So that's just a fun fact for you. Neat, right? We're not gonna, even ever encounter graphs like this by hand, like maybe you'll do it on Desmos or something. Um, but I will say that graphs or, or equations like uh, each of these two examples, root x minus three and five x minus one over two x plus eight, um, both of these are things that we are going to be graphing, this one in 1.6 and this one in section 2.6. So uh, by the end of the year, you will know how to graph both of those functions, I promise you. All right, last item of the day is some tricks with function notation. Uh, and this is just a kind of a mechanical problem. You've maybe seen problems like this before, but it's a, a place that I find often errors are made. And you know, I wanna talk about some of the common errors and things that, that happen. So first uh, is say if f of x equals blah, blah, blah. And here they're calling it f of x. So we can assume it's a function, but also I notice that this is a x squared. So this is a parabola. And parabolas are pretty much automatically functions because you can tell that they will definitely pass the vertical line test. So this is a function, just nice to think about. Um, part A says f, I'll write it bigger, f of minus five. And so then what this is saying is replace x with negative five. 
everywhere you see an X. And so I like to do it. I like to actually write out F of X. And then I'll write out right beneath it, F of minus five. Now what I'm gonna do here is because this minus five is replacing the X entirely, when I plug it in, I'm gonna make sure I put enough parentheses on. So I'm gonna do negative five squared minus two times negative five plus seven. Simplify, this is gonna become 25 plus 10 plus seven or 42. And let's double check that on our calculator uh, just to be nice. So let's see, let me do it. Negative five squared <clears throat> minus uh, two times minus five plus seven. Uh, what? I got minus eight. Yeah, so this is the, the most common mistake I see when you're plugging in a negative number in function notation is that um, People either forget the, or they, I don't know if they forget or they just don't think about the like order of operations. Those parentheses right there are super important. And so if I want this to actually work, you have to go in and do this. Boom, 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 boom. And that should work. Yeah. Oh, by the way, other fun fact about your calculator, since we're plugging in negatives, and you probably, maybe you know this or maybe you don't, there's two negatives. There's the subtraction negative, that's like with the operations, and there's the negative down here that creates a negative number. And you can see that they're like slightly different. Like if I try to type negative three, that doesn't work. Oh. So when you're doing an expression like this, if you're getting errors, Make sure you're using the correct minus symbol and the correct subtraction symbol. Um, it's just something to watch out for. Now we're going to look at part B, which is f of x plus 4. This is my favorite because it's a new, it's like a function. It's variables. And folks always go like, oh, I know what to do with the numbers. What, what, what happens when there's an x in here? Is this even possible? Yes, of course it's possible. So I'm going to write f of x equals x squared minus 2x plus 7. And if it, I want to find f of x plus 4, I'm going to do like a little of this. What I'm going to do is everywhere that there was an x, I'm going to replace it, like right, with a parentheses x, I'm going to replace it with a parentheses x plus 4. So that's going to equal x plus 4 squared minus 2 x plus 4 plus seven. And that's how you do this. Now you have to simplify it. Remember that x plus four squared is not x squared plus four squared. It's actually x squared plus eight x plus 16 minus two x uh, minus eight plus seven, which when you simplify everything, I see an x squared. Uh, I see six, whoa, I see a 6x, and then I see 16 minus 8 plus 7, so that's uh, plus 15. So you can, in fact, do something like f of x plus 4. Your result, then, is another parabola. Because what you've actually done is a shift of your graph. If the original graph was here, I don't know what the graph actually is, so this is like a, an if, then the new graph is another parabola that's shifted, in this case, four units over. And so that's what doing this does, uh, is, is actually cr just moving your graphs around. Uh, we'll learn about that in section 1.6 as well, if you are curious. Finally, I want to look at... Uh, f of minus x, and I'm going to write it over here. So if f of x is x squared minus 2x plus 7, what would f of minus x be?
We're going to do it in the same way. Everywhere I see an x, I'm going to replace it with minus x in parentheses, just like with the minus 5 being really careful with those parens. So it's going to be minus x paren squared minus 2x plus 7. The reason, by the way, that we do this is for a symmetry test. Because if you think about it, right, here's x, here's minus x. So if x and minus x have the same value, then the graph should have some symmetry. Oh. John says, I need parentheses. I also need a, a minus x. I just wrote it wrong. Minus 2 minus x. There we go. Um, so this is actually a symmetry test. Uh, but let's simplify it and see what happens. So then this, negative x times negative x becomes positive x. Uh, but was this plus 2x? No, it's minus 2x. So then this becomes x squared plus 2x plus 7. And what we'll actually do, and this is in section 1.3, so it's coming up real soon, is we'll compare the original to the minus x version. And in this case, I notice that they're not the same. So there will be no symmetry. Uh, but we'll cover more about the symmetry, the actual symmetry part of the test in the next section. Hello again, and thank you all for watching this slightly strange video. You've been watching ECMath, and I'll see you all next time.